Hi everyone, Dave Sugden of Evidence at Trial. Today, we're going to talk about character evidence and we're gonna do it both through the California Code of Evidence as well as the Federal Rules of Evidence. Now, this is an area of law that's super important, but lawyers and litigators can get tripped up a little bit. So let's simplify it and understand it well enough to apply it both in depositions and in trial. Now, it's important to understand when we're talking about character evidence, what we're talking about is evidence that's relevant, but for some reason it's being limited or excluded. And so the reason why it's excluded is because sometimes it can prove too much. And so, for example, let's assume we have a breach of contract case, and the plaintiff says the defendant breached the contract, but what the plaintiff wants to do is bring in a line of witnesses that will all testify that the defendant is a jerk. Is that relevant? Maybe it is, because sometimes jerks can breach contracts. On the other hand, it might prove too much. And the reason why is because the jury may think, we're not sure if he or she breached the contract, but we sure don't like that defendant because we don't like jerks. And so we're therefore wanting to find in favor of the plaintiff. What the law says is, no, we have to limit and exclude character evidence that proves too much. So. When we think about the rule of character evidence, one way to think of it is a general rule of exclusion followed by a number of exceptions, similar to the hearsay rule. The hearsay rule says that it's generally inadmissible, but we have a number of exceptions. The difference with character evidence, which makes it a little bit trickier, is that the reason why character evidence may be allowed impacts the type of evidence that's allowed. So let's get into it and make sure we all can understand and apply it. The first question we want to ask is, are we even talking about character evidence? Because character evidence, the general rule, is that it's inadmissible to prove that someone's character or trait of character was the way that person acted on a specific occasion. Habit evidence, on the other hand, is admissible. What's the difference? Case law says that character evidence is someone's tendency or propensity to act in a certain way given a certain set of circumstances. Habit evidence, on the other hand, is a conditioned semi-automatic response that ha happens in a repeated set of circumstances. What's the difference? It's often very judge dependent. What might be habit evidence to one judge might be character to another. But the best way to think of it is, let's assume someone has the character trait of speeding. They have a tendency, a propensity to speed when they're on the highway. That's character evidence. It doesn't happen all the time, but they tend to do that. A judge is most likely to find that's character evidence, so just because the person has a tendency to speed, that can't be used to prove that on a certain date in question, he or she was speeding. What about wearing a seatbelt? This is something that the person does all the time. It's a semi-automatic, almost unconscious response. It always happens. And so if, a, if evidence could be provided that the person always wore his or her seatbelt, that was the habit that could be used to prove that on the date in question, he or she was wearing the seatbelt. Now, in the event we're talking about character evidence, we then want to ask, why is it being offered? And so the first question is, is character even at issue? And what we see is, in certain cases, a person's character absolutely could be at issue. So, for example, in a defamation case, if someone sues and says, you hurt my character, well, you've put it at issue. And so, if it's at issue, the type of evidence that's allowed is almost unlimited. The person can offer opinion evidence, reputation evidence, and specific instances of conduct. All of it can come in because character is actually at issue. But let's say that it's not at issue. Can someone offer character evidence for, quote, another purpose? And the answer is yes. And so, for example, in the, in the federal rules, you have rule 404A that says character evidence is generally inadmissible. But 404B says it can be admitted for some other purpose. Same thing in California, 1101B is this other purpose. And so what are the other purposes that character evidence can be admitted? They're listed here, motive, opportunity, intent, 
preparation, plan, knowledge, identity, or absence of mistake. How is this applied? Let's assume we have a case where a plaintiff is suing a defendant for, for fraud. And the, the plaintiff alleges that the defendant sued the, uh, sent these faulty widgets. And the widgets were no good. And the defendant says, well, the, the widgets may not have been good, but it was a mistake. I, had no, I wasn't trying to defraud you. I just was mistaken that these widgets didn't work. These widgets didn't work. The plaintiff may call another party in. And that party's going to say, I also got widgets from this defendant. They also were no good. And I sent the defendant a letter saying these widgets were no good. And all of this happened before the plaintiff in question bought the widgets. The plaintiff could say, I'm offering this not as character evidence to say, because he sold faulty widgets to this person, he must have sold them to me. No, I'm offering them for a different purpose. I'm offering to show that because this person had knowledge that he previously sold faulty widgets and got a letter from someone, he can't claim he was mistaken. The line is very thin between what is substantive character evidence and character evidence offered for another purpose, and so it's really important to hone in on why it's being applied. In terms of the type of evidence, when you're talking about character evidence for another purpose, it's only specific instances of conduct. In other words, the widget example. Finally, character evidence can also be used when credibility is at issue. When is credibility at issue? It's always at issue. And so the law imposes certain limitations when you're introducing character evidence just to talk about someone's credibility. The first thing is it can only start with an attack. You can't, for example, call a witness that testifies that the light was green and then have another witness come and testify and say that first witness is a trustworthy person, has a great reputation. You can't do that. On the other hand, a witness can be called to offer opinion or reputation evidence about someone's credibility. And so if it's been attacked, the allowable evidence is either reputation or opinion. Once it's been attacked, another witness can come forward to say, well, no, I think this person has a good reputation or I have a good opinion of that evidence. When this type of evidence is allowed in general, the court will limit the cross-examination. Again, we want to limit the time and limit the scope of what's potentially proving too much when it comes to character evidence. So that is character evidence. I hope this was helpful. If it was, please download, rate, review, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and if you want to do a really deep dive on these rules and learn how to apply them in trial, in depositions, visit evidenceattrial.com and look at our on-demand courses. Thanks for watching.